This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 33 A Battle of Monsters. Saturday, August 15th. The sea unbroken all round. No land in sight. The horizon seems extremely distant. My head is still stupefied with the vivid reality of my dream. My uncle has had no dreams, but he is out of temper. He examines the horizon all round with his glass and folds his arms with the air of an injured man. I remark that Professor Liedenbrock has a tendency to relapse into an impatient mood, and I make note of it in my log. All my danger and sufferings were needed to strike a spark of human feeling out of him. But now that I am well, his nature has resumed its sway. And yet, what cause was there for anger? Is not the voyage prospering as favorably as possible under the circumstances? Is not the raft spinning along with marvelous speed? You seem anxious, my uncle, I said, seeing him continually with his glass to his eye. Anxious? No, not at all. Impatient, then? One might be, with less reason than now. Yet we are going very fast. What does that signify? I am not complaining that the rate is slow, but that the sea is so wide. I then remembered that the professor, before starting, had estimated the length of this underground sea at 30 leagues. Now we had made three times the distance, yet still the southern coast was not in sight. We're not descending, as we ought to be, the professor declares. We are losing time, and the fact is, I have not come all this way to take a little sail upon a pond on a raft. He called this sea a pond, and our long voyage taking a little sail. But, I remarked, since we have followed the road that Saknussem has shown us, that is just the question. Have we followed that road? Did Saknussem meet with a sheet of water? Did he cross it? Has not the stream that we followed led us altogether astray? At any rate, we cannot feel sorry to have come so far. The prospect is magnificent. And, but I don't care for prospects. I came with an object, and I mean to attain it. Therefore, don't talk to me about views and prospects. I take this as my answer, and I leave the professor to bite his lips with impatience. At six in the evening, Hans asks for his wages and the three Rix dollars are counted out to it. Sunday, August 16th. Nothing new, weather unchanged. The wind freshens. On awaking, my first thought was to observe the intensity of the light. I was possessed with an apprehension lest the electric light should grow dim or fail altogether. But there seemed no reason to fear. The shadow of the raft was clearly outlined upon the surface of the waves. Truly this sea is of infinite width. It must be as wide as the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. And why not? My uncle took soundings several times. He tied the heaviest of our pickaxes to long rope, which he let down 200 fathoms. No bottom yet, and we had some difficulty in hauling up our plummet. But when the pick was shipped again, Hans pointed out on its surface deep prints as if it had been violently compressed between two hard bodies. I looked at the hunter. Tenga, he said. I should not understand him, and turned to my uncle, who was entirely absorbed in his calculations. I had rather not disturb him while he is quiet. I return to the Icelander. He, by snapping motion of his jaws, conveys his idea to me. Teeth, I cried considering the iron bar with more attention. Yes, indeed, those are the marks of teeth imprinted upon the metal. The jaws which they arm must be possessed of amazing strength. Is there some monster beneath us belonging to the extinct races, more voracious than the shark, more fearful in vastness than the whales? I could not take my eyes off this indented iron bar. Surely will my last night's dream be realized. These thoughts agitated me all day, and my imagination scarcely calmed down after several hours sleep. Monday, August 17th. I am trying to recall the peculiar instincts of the monsters of the pre-Adamite world 
who, coming next in succession after the mollusks, the crustaceans, and the fishes, preceded the animals of mammalian race upon the earth. The world then belonged to reptiles. These monsters held the mastery of the seas of the secondary period. They possessed a perfect organization, gigantic proportions, prodigious strength. The saurians of our day, the alligators and crocodiles, are but feeble reproductions of their forefathers of primitive ages. I shudder as I recall these monsters to my remembrance. No human eye has ever beheld them living. They burdened this earth a thousand ages before man appeared, but their fossil remains, found in the argillaceous limestone called by the English the Leas, have enabled their colossal structure to be perfectly built up again and anatomically ascertained. I saw at the Hamburg Museum the skeleton of one of these creatures, 30 feet in length. Am I then fated, I, a denizen of the earth, to be placed face to face with these representatives of a long extinct family? No, surely it cannot be, yet the deep marks of conical teeth upon the iron pick are certainly those of a crocodile. My eyes are fearfully bent upon the sea. I dread to see one of these monsters darting forth from its submarine caves. I suppose Professor Liedenbrock was of my opinion too, and even shared my fears. For after having examined the pig, his eyes traversed the ocean from side to side. What a very bad notion that was of his, I thought to myself, to take soundings just here. He had disturbed some monstrous beast in its remote den, and if we were not attacked on our voyage, I look at our guns and see that they are all right. My uncle notices it and looks on approvingly. Already, wildly disturbed regions of the surface of the water indicate some commotion below. The danger is approaching. We must be on the lookout. Tuesday, August 18th. Evening came, or rather the time, when sleep weighs down the weary eyelids. For there is no night here, and the ceaseless light wearies the eyes with its persistency, just as if we were sailing under the Arctic sun. Hans was at the helm. During his watch, I slept. Two hours afterwards, a terrible shock awoke me. The raft was heaved up on a watery mountain and pitched down again at a distance of twenty fathoms. What is the matter? shouted my uncle. Have we struck land? Hans pointed with his finger at a dark mass six hundred yards away, rising and falling alternately with heavy plunges. I looked and cried. It's an enormous porpoise! Yes, replied my uncle, and there is a sea lizard of vast size. And farther on, a monstrous crocodile. Look at its vast jaws and its rows of teeth. It is diving down. There's a whale, a whale, cried the professor. I can see its great fins. See how he is throwing out air and water through his blowers? And in fact, two liquid columns were rising to a considerable height above the sea. We stood amazed, thunderstruck the presence of such a herd of marine monsters. They were of supernatural dimensions. The smallest of them would have crunched our raft, crew and all, at one snap of its huge jaws. Hans went to tack to get away from the dangerous neighborhood, but he sees, on the other hand, enemies not less terrible, a tortoise forty feet long and a serpent of thirty, lifting its fearful head and gleaming eyes above the flood. Flight was out of the question now. The reptiles rose. They wheeled around our little raft with a rapidity greater than that of express trains. They described around us gradually narrowing circles. I took up my rifle. But what could a ball do against the scaly armor with which enormous beasts were clad? We stood dumb with fear. They approached us close. On one side, the crocodile. On the other, the serpent. The remainder of the sea monsters have disappeared. I prepare to fire. Hans stops me by a gesture. The two monsters pass within 150 yards of the raft and hurl themselves upon one another with a fury which prevents them from seeing us. At 300 yards from us, the battle was fought. We could distinctly observe the two monsters engaged in a deadly conflict, but it now seems to me as if the other animals were taking part in the fray. The porpoise, the whale, the lizard, the tortoise, Every moment I seem to see one or the other of them. I point to the Icelander. He shakes his head negatively. 
Bah, he says. What two? Does he mean that there are only two animals? He is right, said my uncle, whose glass never left his eye. Surely you must be mistaken, I cried. No, the first of those monsters has a porpoise's snout, a lizard's head, a crocodile's teeth, and hence our mistake. It is the Ichthyosaurus, the fish lizard, the most terrible of the ancient monsters of the deep. And the other? The other is a Plesiosaurus, almost lizard, a serpent armored with a carapace and the paddles of a turtle. He is the dreadful enemy of the other. Hans had spoken truly. Two monsters only were creating all this commotion, and before my eyes are two reptiles of the primitive world. I can distinguish the eye of the Ichthyosaurus, glowing like a red-hot coal and as large as a man's head. Nature has endowed it with an optical apparatus of extreme power and capable of resisting the pressure of the great volume of water in the depths of its it inhabits. It is appropriately called the Sororian Whale, for it has both the swiftness and the rapid movements of this monster of our own day. This one is not less than a hundred feet long, and I can judge of its size when it sweeps over the waters the vertical coils of its tail. Its jaw is enormous, and according to naturalists, it is armed with no less than 182 teeth. The Plesiosaurus, a serpent with a cylindrical body and a short tail, has four flappers or paddles to act like oars. Its body is entirely covered with a thick armor of scales, and its neck, as flexible as a swan's, rises 30 feet above the waves. Those huge creatures attacked each other with the greatest animosity. They heaved around them liquid mountains, which rolled even to our raft and rocked it perilously. Twenty times we were near capsizing. Hissings of prodigious force are heard. The two beasts are fast locked together. I cannot distinguish the one from the other. The probable rage of the conqueror inspires us with intense fear. One hour, two hours pass. The struggle continues with unabated ferocity. The combatants alternately approach and recede from our raft. We remain motionless, ready to fire. Suddenly, the Ichthyosaurus and the Plesiosaurus disappear below, leaving a whirlpool eddying in the water. Several minutes pass by while the fight goes on underwater. All at once, an enormous head is darted up the head of the Plesiosaurus. The monster is wounded to death. I no longer see his scaly armor. Only his long neck shoots up, drops again, coils and uncoils, droops, lashes the waters like a gigantic whip, and rides like a worm that you tread on. The water is splashed for a long way around. The spray almost blinds us, but soon the reptile's agony draws to an end. Its movements become fainter, its contortions cease to be so violent, and the long serpentine form lies a lifeless log on the laboring deep. As for the Ithiosaurus, has he returned to his submarine cavern, or will he reappear on the surface of the sea? End of chapter 33